Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. I invite you to sit up a little straighter, close your eyes. Take a deep inhale into your belly. Gaze up, press the tongue on the top of your mouth. When you feel like exhaling, just inhale a little more into your heart. And exhale, getting taller. Thank you, Dennis, for that wonderful introduction. Um, I'm going to be presenting my doctoral research. First, I'd just like to give full credit to my advisor, Dr. Stephen Barker. None of this would be possible without him. I'm just going to go straight into the research. So first thing we did was a collaboration with Dr. Leanna Standish. She created a number of different ayahuasca brews and sent them to us. And we set up a complicated analytical chemistry system to quantify some different compounds in it. The harmalas, harmine, and its O-demethylated metabolite, harmol, harmaline, harmol, and also tetrahydroharmol and 2-methyl tetrahydro beta carboline. These are all harmines that function as MAOIs and are found in the ayahuasca vine itself, Banisteria sopsis copy. And we also looked at a number of dif different methylated tryptamines. Um, DMT, it's uh, metabolite NMT, or precursor, and also um, something that hasn't been researched much, which is a big finding in our paper, this DMT anoxide. It's a major metabolite of DMT, and we wanted to see if it was actually in uh, ayahuasca itself as well as 5-MeO-DMT and 5-hydroxy-DMT, or bufotamine. And we, we developed this direct inject chromatography electrospray ionization mass spectrometry procedure to simultaneously quantify all these. I'm, I'm going to leave the details to the process to your own investigation. Um, and here's some of the data. We found that the major components observed, observed in ayahuasca were tetrahydra, harmine, and harmine, followed by DMT and harmaline. And we found these other ones at much lower concentrations. The main thing you find is these beta carbolines and DMT. And we found no DMT and oxide. So it's, it's only a metabolite created in a mammalian species. We also compared a number of different ayahuasca brews that Leanna Standish obtained from different places in Peru, Brazil, and Hawaii. And here's some of the data. Some was from Shipibo lineages. Some was from mainland of Hawaii and Peru. And we found them to actually have very similar levels of DMT, ranging from 0.24 to 0.78 milligrams per milliliter while harmine levels were slightly more variable, uh, 1.14 to 3.92 milligrams per milliliter. We also have a number of future ayahuasca publications that is collected for, and hopefully we will be publishing them soon, looking at the anatomical distribution of DMT in P. verides and beta carbolines in beta cap, in uh, Stereoptis capi. We found that no DMT is in B. capi, the vine. That that was pretty well known, but never actually demonstrated. And an interesting finding that is not practiced in any brewing methods I'm aware of that, we actually find the highest amount of beta carbolines in the leaves, and lesser amounts in the glands, and actually the least amount in the vine itself. This is probably a weight thing, that there's, there's actually much more grams weight why the vine is, is usually used, or there could be a whole number of different compounds that we're totally unaware of. We're, we're characterizing these plants, but, but these are all really theories that, that these are the main compounds working. There could be, there could be other ones we don't know about. Um, we found that both the leaf and the nodes of P. verides contain DMT. A uh, second study we looked at was comparing the, the weight ratios in brewing methods. So the idea was that if you have more of the vine in the brew, it might protect the DMT from the psychotria. And we found that to not be the case. We found that you get a pretty linear relationship in 
in harmine, you, you increase it to one to two to, from one to 16 and you get pretty much the same increase in harmine. And while the DMT does re remain pretty constant as, as you might expect. We have uh, another study hopefully preparing ayahuasca for clinical trials. And again, full credit to Leanna Standish here for, for all her efforts in this, brewing all these different batches up. And we found that it's probably going to be best to brew them separately and then combine them, that they're stable when stored, that you don't find any loss of DMT or harmine after 12 months of refrigeration or freezing. It still seems pretty stable. And that it can be sterilized by life positivization or autoclave without psychoactive loss, and that they're free of heavy metals. These are just basic science things we're going to need to do to get it to therapeutic clinical trials. And we have another study looking at actual decocting and brewing methods, how much vine, how much leaf you would use, how much liquid you need to boil it down to, and how many doses that might work to, working towards a standardized product. That's pretty much the summary of the characterization. And the second part of my thesis was on metabolism. So Dr. Jordi Reber, I believe he's here somewhere provided us with these blood and urine samples to run these studies. We did the analytical chemistry. We pretty much used the same assay we had set up, except we added a few more chemicals to it. We added um, this one, and we looked for a potential metabolite, dimethylkynurinamine. We didn't find it, and we added indole acetic acid to it, which I'll be talking about a bit. So just a quick background on DMT metabolism. DMT can be demethylated to give you NMT, N-methyltryptamine, and it can be deaminated by MAOA. This is the most common pathway. If you just took DMT orally by itself, it would pretty much all get converted into indole acetic acid. The problem with using indole acetic acid as a marker for DMT in urine or blood is that it can come from a number of sources. It can come from and methyltryptamine, it can also come from tryptamine. So it's not a very good marker of, of DMT in, a, in the system. And it can be anoxygenated into DMT and oxide, which was sort of a major finding of, of our papers. You find it at much higher concentrations than DMT itself, as we'll see. It can also be rearranged to form this uh, harmine 2-methyl tetrahydrobeta carboline. So, we got these urine samples from Dr. Jordi Reba, 10 of them. He was using a freeze-dried form, which allows for double-blind placebo-controlled studies. And this is a chromatogram. This is the kind of outputs we get on uh, some of these chemistry analysis we're doing. And contains a pretty high dose of harmine and pretty average dose of, uh, of DMT. So the urine method, again, uses high-pressure liquid chromatography, electrospay ionization, selected reactive monitoring, and it's a really, really good method that people can send us samples, we can run them real quick, and, and get data back to them, hopefully leading to clinical trials and, and more things like that. These, these methods are going to be necessary to, to get to, to more accepted research. And here is some of the urine data. We found that the major metabolite in our initial assay without looking for the indole acetic acid was DMT and oxide at around 11 micrograms per milliliter. And in the later sample, tetrahydroharmine, the beta carboline was the major component. And we also saw some of the O demethylated metabolites of the harmines, harmol and harmalol at lower concentrations. Um, the major harmala alkaloids appear to undergo metabolism by O-methylation, O-demethylation, excuse me, to harmol and harmalol, and then they can be conjugated through this gluconidation or sulfication process. It's like um, the, they get conjugated up with other proteins, and you need to do a process to deconjugate them. And we found that in urine samples which underwent this enzyme hydrolysis, 
we actually found 40 to 60 fold amount increases in the amount of these beta carbolines. And they, af after the treatment, they were far higher than the uh, initial tetrahydroharmine that seemed to be the highest. Um, MAO inhibition after ayahuasca appears to be either incomplete or short lived, as large amounts of indoleacetic acid were already detected in the first four hours. Jordy estimated that the inhibition is only around 15% of the MAOA in, in your gut. Very minor, but enough, I guess, to get the DMT up into your brain. Um, here is some data from uh, Jordy's, was the first author in this paper. And actually, less than 1% of the actual administered dose of DMT could re be recovered in urine. It, it gets completely metabolized into other things. Around 50% was recovered as endoacetic acid. We can't totally say that it's coming just from the DMT because the MAO effect, MAOI effect of the, the harmines could be increasing amount of tryptamine and, and resulting in more endoacetic acid. And around 10% was recovered as this DMT and oxide, suggesting that MAO inhibition could shift metabolism from oxidative deamination to N oxidation. And we're hoping that we can use this DMT and oxide as a marker for endogenous processes because it's, it's very difficult to, to find DMT in blood or urine and make any correlations with endogenously produced methyltryptamines. It's, it's very difficult. We're, we'll review that shortly here. Um, so recovery of DMT plus metabolites reached around 68% for enzyme-treated samples. Still a, a lot unknown where, what actually happens to it. Um, again, OD demethylation plus conjugation seems to represent an important but probably not the only degradation route for the harmala alkaloids in humans as harmalol and harmalol concentrations were 10 and 5-fold the amounts ingested with ayahuasca demonstrating that most of the harmol and harmalol recovered in the urine after ayahuasca had to be formed through this metabolic breakdown. So most of it gets, gets changed into harmol and harmalol, and we can detect that in the urine. And just, it, it was very variable based on, I, it, there's different enzymes that people metabolize these harmols very differently based on your genetics, they've found. And we also made a blood method. In urine, you're looking at microgram quantities. In blood, we're only finding nanogram amounts of these very small amounts. Uh, a similar method, but we do this little protein precipitation so we can actually analyze the blood. And here's the data. We found that DMT and oxide was three times higher than DMT itself in blood. And Significant endoacetic acid increases also suggest this minor, minor MAO inhibition from the beta carbolines. And enzyme treatment of a selected patient sample did not show any significant increase in any of the major alkaloids. So this conjugation process is, is just, it doesn't get recirculated in the, in the body after they get conjugated because we can't find it in the blood. Suggests that the extensive conjugation of the harmalas in particular does not lead to any significant recirculation of the compounds from the kidney. Great. So some major conclusions from this part of the study. We developed this method to quantitate 14 of the major alkaloids, including the number of potential metabolites. It would be a suitable method for an, any clinical forensic research in ayahuasca and the major metabolite again of DMT appears as the corresponding N oxide, DMT and oxide found in blood, plasma and urine. Very little DMT is detected in the urine or blood despite the inhibition of monoamine oxidase and again OD methylation plus conjugation represents Important pathway, but probably not the only one for the harmala metabolism. So, on to this endogenous story. Potential biosynthesis of DMT from tryptophan using indole and methyltransferase, INMT. This is tryptophan. It can be decarboxylated 
to make tryptamine. Tryptamine can then undergo a transfer with SAMe. This is S-adenosine methionine. This is a supplement you can buy, and it, it takes the methyl off of this and puts it on the tryptamine to give you NMT and methyltryptamine. And then it, another process, there's, there's two steps with indole and methyltransferase, and then you would have DMT. You could pl replace tryptophan, or you could replace tryptamine with serotonin, 5-hydroxy DMT, and you would end up with, with uh, I mean, excuse me, you would end up with 5-hydroxy DMT, starting with serotonin. And you could also start with 5-MeO tryptamine, and you would end up with 5-MeO DMT. And um, it's a similar pathway. Again, just a review of the metabolism can be deaminated by MAO to give you indole acetic acid. We can't say it's just coming from DMT, though, because it could be coming from these other sources. It can be N-demethylated. That would be going back to NMT, so it can be converted back into NMT, or the N-oxygenation into the DMT and oxide. And it can also be, t we, we thought it might turn into this dimethylkynurenine. We couldn't find any, so it doesn't seem like a route. And just can also be converted into actually beta carbolines, other harmolas, DMT. So we looked at all of the studies we could find that claim to detect DMT, 5-MeO, and 5-hydroxy-DMT. And this is a little summary of our findings. We reviewed 69 published studies reporting the detection, and a short summary. Um, out of 861 individuals' urine samples, we found 43% claimed they were positive for DMT. And among the actual controls, 64% were positive. So they were finding it in both controls and their patient's blood in all of the studies. Kind of started with this schizophrenia hypothesis that DMT was producing in schizophrenia, and the, the review does not support that at all. Um, so a total of all of these, when we combine them, we got to about 50%. And we also looked in blood. We reviewed all the papers that claimed to find it in blood. And we found about 15% of the patients. And we conclude that DMT and related compounds do appear endogenous and based on our research may be best measured in the body following an MAOI and by monitoring for the N-oxide. So just a, a little more thoughts on endogenously produced DMT. You actually find, this is an old study by Thomas, you find the mRNA actually highest in the lung and the heart. So you look in the brain and you don't really find much mRNA. So the main theory I have these days is that the lung and heart actually could be tr producing the DMT. Probably more likely it's actually producing more 5-MeO DMT, and the pineal could be producing more of a, a harmala, an MAOI, like penaline, Jace Calloway's work. And there actually appears to be two types of expression of INMT, new synthesis shown by this mRNA work, but also a pre-stable or ready, ready form based on Kazi's uh, work, which I'll just briefly review right here. He found, he, he actually made an, an antibody and found it um, INMT robust in pineal, suggesting that it, it, it could be produced in the pineal gland. Also in the retina, which is interesting, suggesting DMT could actually be produced in your eye. There's some, some new papers. Maybe the, the visual effects are happening right there in your eye. I mean, crazy. <laughs> <laughs> And uh, also in spinal cord that you find this, this uh, protein, the actual INMT from the antibody. So another paper looked, and, and there's a lot of, of new research on the sigma receptor. Okay, I'm, I'm there. <laughs> and they, they, found, uh, they found it in close proximity to these sigma-1 receptors, if you're following that field. It's sort of this orphan receptor that they claim might be the receptor for DMT. It has a higher affinity for DMT than like anything else. So 
uh, potential future studies. We want to compare the, pa the metabolism of, of parental versus oral DMT without the presence of an MALI. We want to screen individuals for DMT and DMT anoxide pre-treated with an MALI. And we would like to generate an INMT knockout mouse to see what happens if you don't have this enzyme. It also be, would, would be interesting to generate one that would overproduce this enzyme, see if you can generate lots of DMT. And we'd like to screen pineal tissues and sort of verify some of these theories that uh, Dr. Strathman put out there in his book. We would like to apply the assay to study some ayahuasca analogs. We're all set up to just run as, as many things we can, see what's in them, look at turnover rate, variation, gender differences, disease states, exogenous hallucinogens, see what happens if, if you take LSD, for instance, if that actually produces DMT in your system, uh, mystical experiences, and yoga meditation practices. I, I would like to get some, some data from somebody who's been in a dark room retreat. Supposedly after you stay in the dark for 10 days, melatonin starts becoming 5-MeO-DMT and you just see bright light. So uh, I'd like to thank the collaborators again. None of this is possible without them. Jody Reba, Anna Standish, uh, Andrew Sewell, and hopefully in the future we'll get some samples from these people. And, um, yeah, <laughs> I think it's time for questions. Yeah, thank uh, you very much, Ethan. We have <laughs> thank you, all these people. <laughs> and if you'd like to, uh, if you can read that, you can find my thesis at the LSU website. Congratulations. Congratulations and thank you. Thanks. <laughs> I'm not used to this. Um, when converting the ayahuasca tea to the capsule form, did you see any changes in the potency, effectiveness, half-life, and the DNA structure of the plant to the powder form? That's more of a question for Jordi. He didn't send us actual Brazilian ayahuasca samples. He just sent us the urine and blood samples. So. One quick. Can you find um, DMT on a hair follicle? In what? Hair follicle. Hair the, follicle. Yeah, not the exogenous DMT in hair follicle. Uh, no, it, I don't think. I don't, there's nobody studied it as far as I know. No. Hi, Ethan. I just want to ask you um, about variations in metaboli metabolizing uh, DMT. Uh, if you take one brew uh, and you freeze it and you drink it one day and you drink it the next day, the actual the way it plays out can be completely different for the one individual. Also, the second part of that is within a group, there can be several people that have very strong experiences and some people can have zero experiences. Can you explain why that might be? Yeah, first on the, uh, I would suggest avoiding as many freeze-saw cycles as possible because when we were looking at uh, stability, we just froze it once and then you unfreeze it and, and test it. But if you're, if you're going to actually freeze it, it could lose some potency. I'd say just, just, just the one time, just freeze it one time. I'll yeah, I'd it. say you'd be better off just refrigerating it unless, you know, you don't have to freeze thought unless, unless you want to store it for a long time. Sure. Yeah. And about the variation in the group? Well, yeah, that. well there's some research finding variability in the metabolism of the harmalas based on some genetic differences and that could be one very important factor that people seem to have very different ways that they metabolize the harmalis based on a, a gene. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, I was curious if you had done any analytical work on the vines themselves that the brews were then uh, decocted from, and if you had seen any, uh, I guess, reduction of harmine to harmaline or harmaline to tetrahydroharmine, possibly accounting for the high levels of tetrahydroharmine in the brews when they're not necessarily that high in the vine. Yeah, there's definitely a lot of conversion. Um, it's not an com entirely complete story at this point, just because, you know, it's all so variable, like when the plants are harvested and, and how they're brewed and how long they sit out for. That, that kind of still needs to be investigated more to be totally sure. But, yeah, it does look like it sort of gets converted to the tetrahydrohydrohydrohydrohydrohydrohydrohydrohydrohydrohydrohydrohydrohydrohydrohydrohydrohydrohydrohydrohydrohydrohydrohydrohydrohydrohydrohydrohydrohydrohydrohydroh
do you think that we evolved away from it, or do you think that we just never evolved it? Or if, we, if it is endogenous, why do you think we do have it? Yeah, it, it does seem like we do produce it. We have all the, the chemistry to produce it. And it's interesting, you know, it's like we have serotonin and we have tryptamine and it's just adding, adding a little more complexity to, to the story. And, and they bind here mostly on our 5-HT2A receptors and our, our prefrontal cortex. And, and it, yeah, who knows? I'm, I'm not one to, to, to make any claims, but it seems like it's some sort of complexity evolution process, you know. Yeah. Thank you. I'm sorry, our time is up. The next question, please, in the break. Thank you, Ethan.